Tonight we are continuing our summer school series that we started last week with part two. The biblical precedent behind this entire series is found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. We're going to read this passage every week because every week we need a reminder of what this is all about. It says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the message. Be ready, whether it is convenient or not. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and instruction, for there will be a time when people will not tolerate sound doctrine. Instead, following their own desires, they will accumulate teachers for themselves because they have an insatiable curiosity to hear new things. And they will turn away from hearing the truth, and instead, they will turn aside to myths. You may return to your seats. One of the things that we talked about last week is about how we can view this passage in light of the world, but the fact is this, this passage isn't just talking about the lost, it's talking about the church. So many in the church are tuning their ears into the things that fulfill the curiosities that they wonder about. They look for answers in all the wrong places. Why is it that the first time when we have a question, the first, the first thing that we do is we go to Google? If I need advice, where I go to, I go to YouTube. Some of y'all goofballs, you find a short on TikTok. What, you think in 30 seconds somebody's going to give you the key to life? And we do it. Why else do we follow all these pastors and preachers? Why else do we follow all these churches? Why else do we tune into all these podcasts? Why else do we subscribe to all these channels but to collect information that, quite frankly, could be easily found in the Word of God if we would just bother to open it? This series is about helping us to get our minds wrapped around the foundational doctrine of our faith. Doctrine assumes that there is objective truth. It's a problematic fact in our society that says that truth is subjective and that it is relative in regard to each individual having their own truth and having their own lived experience. But how many of you know either it's true or it's not? Amen? Now, I say this all the time in youth that if the whole word don't say it, none of it does. If you don't know that, if, you, if you've never written that quote down, I want you to write that down in your notes. If the whole word don't say it, none of it does. If I'm trying to construct something that is allegedly biblical doctrine, then I need to consult the entirety of the word to form that doctrinal conclusion. If I'm just picking little pieces out because I like what that word says, I like what that verse says, and I'm running with it, which many pastors do, many preachers do, many teachers do, and many an attender of church does, then all I'm doing is using the Bible to teach the doctrine that I want to teach. But we have been called to preach the message. In 2 Timothy, Paul charges Timothy and charges us today with this, preach the message. So we need to move laterally across scripture. We need to get a grip on biblical precedent before we form what we call doctrine. Tonight, I'm going to talk about the Trinity. Now, in cross assembly, we are in Assemblies of God Church, and the Assemblies of God is Trinitarian. We are Trinitarian. Now, this means that we believe in one God. How many gods? In three persons. How many persons? Three persons. How many gods? How many persons? Now, there are some dissenting opinions when it comes to Trinitarianism. The Muslims and the Jews say that we're just playing with words and that we actually worship three gods. The Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses expand upon it, belittling the role of Jesus and exalting our capacity to become as gods. Oneness Pentecostals believe that there is one God, a singular divine spirit with no distinction of persons who manifests himself in different ways, including Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
But these all stand in sharp contrast to the doctrine of three distinct and eternal persons posited by Trinitarian theology. To get started tonight, I want to talk with you about personhood. Now, we are going to be very specific about our language because how many of you know if we aren't specific with our language, it's easy to misinterpret and form a different truth. So we are going to be specific about our language tonight. I told you before that Trinity means one being in three persons. In this case, this being is God in three persons, right? One being, three persons, that's a trinity. Now let's break down those two things, being and person, so that we understand what language we're using and why. The definition of being is very simple. It's the quality about you that makes you what you are. The quality about you that makes you what you are is your being. I am a human, hence being called a human being. Now, what makes me a human, you might say? Body, mind, soul, spirit. If I don't have all those qualities, I am not a human being. Some of y'all think your dog's going to heaven with you. Sorry. Your dog don't have a spirit. And your flesh isn't what goes to heaven. Your spirit is what goes to heaven. So if you don't have a spirit, it's kind of hard to make the trip. You know what I'm saying? So what makes me a human being is that I am body, mind, soul, and spirit. So that is my being. That is what I am. But person is the quality about you that makes you who you are. Person is the quality about you that makes you who you are. See, I'm a human, but I'm also, more specifically, a human named Pepper. And Pepper is intense, passionate, inquisitive, emotional, amongst many other things. But those are factors that anybody close to me would say, yep, that's Pepper. Now, we need to understand that these two things, working in harmony to express what and who we are, don't form a contradiction. They actually explain us more specifically. It would be a general thing for somebody in a crowd to go, yes, that is a human, versus, yes, that is pepper. One is just a little bit more specific than the other, but both are true. Now, when people who oppose Trinitarianism oppose it, most times they oppose it on the terms of saying that these are two contradictory ideas. They're not. It's just one is more descriptive than the other. See, it's general for us to express who we are as human beings. It's specific for us to refer to the person that we are. We must understand this, though. Both are true. It is true that you are a human being. It is true that you are a human being. It is true that you are a human being. It is also true that you have a name. It's also true that there is a who that you are beyond the what that you are. Now, some say that the Bible never uses the word Trinity, and that is correct. The original writers of Scripture did not use the word Trinity. They also didn't use the word Sea for the Sea of Galilee. They used the word body of water in the Galilee. We just had a different, a little bit better descriptive word, which, by the way, it's not a sea, it's a lake. If you've ever been to Israel, you know it's not a sea, it's a lake. It's small. Dude, some of y'all could probably swim across it. It doesn't have salt water. It isn't connected to an ocean. It's fresh water fed by rivers. It's a lake. But they didn't use that word. They also didn't use the words possessed or oppressed, which we've talked about just a little bit ago. They used the word demonized. But what we've done is we've read scripture and we've noticed that there's some different ways organization takes place. 
Sometimes it's from the inside out, possession. Sometimes it's from the outside in, oppression. It's just a better description of the word that was used. Well, how can there be a better description for the word? Because God made people to adapt and to grow and to learn. And so as language evolved, we came up with better ways of expressing more complex ideals. It doesn't mean that people have never been demon-possessed. People have certainly been demon-possessed. It doesn't mean they haven't been oppressed from the outside in. In fact, some of you guys experience that now. You guys are the most depressed generation in history. Chances are somebody in this room struggles with depression. Chances are a good bit of you do. It doesn't mean that you're possessed by a demon. It just means you got some pressure. It's called oppression. To say that the lake of Galilee is the lake and not just a body of water doesn't mean that scripture was wrong. It just means there's a better defining word to describe what it is. And while the word Trinity is never specifically expressed, tonight I want us to take a look at how Trinity is shown to us throughout the word of God. Now, before we get into this, I want to give you some really simple examples so that you understand what we're talking about when I can say two things can be true at once. I can say, in telling a story about something that happened, that I swam to the shore on the other side. You might have been there with me, and when you tell the story, you say that I swam across the river. Both of them, different words, both of them tell the same story. I can say, I almost drowned. You can say, I was caught in the current. And both can be true. So the argument against the lack of the use of the word Trinity is a weak argument at best. We have taken a brief overview of what the dissenting opinions are about the Trinity. What Muslims and Jews think what Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses think, what Oneness Pentecostals think. But let's take a look at the Trinity starting at creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 2 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was without shape and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the watery deep, but the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. Now we believe that the Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you might have done the math. You're like, okay, the Father is in here, the Spirit is in here, but where's the Son? Thank you for asking. Let's jump from the beginning of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament, John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God, and the word was fully God, and the word was with God at the beginning. All things were created by him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind, and the light shines on in the darkness, but the darkness has not mastered it. Who was this word? Jesus. Jesus was this word. So from the very beginning, we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Nobody says the word Trinity, but we see that word expressed in this story. Now, you might say, okay, well, if they're distinct persons, then they must be able to be in separate locations. If you're distinct and unique and you're not just one in different forms, then you have to be able to be in separate locations at the same time. Is there ever a time in the Bible where the distinct persons of God are in separate locations? And the answer is yes. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 18, verse 1 through 5. Y'all going to be standing a lot tonight. Those seats, they're just kind of there to uh, be behind you because we're going to be in the Word a lot, okay? That's what you need to do if we're finding what biblical precedent is. If we're figuring out what doctrine is, we need to read the Word. So Genesis 18, 1 through 5, it says, The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent during the hottest time of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing across from him. 
When he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by and leave your servant. Let a little water be brought so that you may all, or so that I may wash all of your feet and rest under the tree. Let's zoom in a little bit. Let's take a look at verse 1a. It says, the Lord appeared to Abraham. Now, I don't know if you were like me, but when I grew up in kids' church, I heard that it was three angels that came before Abraham and presented the promise about the son and all that kind of stuff that they were going to have. Did y'all ever get taught that it was three angels? I got taught that it was three angels. I thought it was three angels the whole time. The Bible does not say that at all. In fact, he said, it says the Lord appeared to him, and the, the Lord, that word that's used there, there's multiple words for Lord that are used in the Old Testament. This word is the word Jehovah. That ain't angels, buddy. No angels named Jehovah. All right? So this is God with two angels as wingmen, which is, it kind of goes hard. You know what I'm saying? Now, I want you to notice one more thing really quickly. Did anybody see when God and the two angels arrive? What time of the day was it? Does anybody remember? It was in the hottest part of the day. Now, I want you to hold on to that information. Now, this is the story where uh, God gives Abraham and Sarah the promise that they're going to have a son, and she laughs and all that kind of stuff. We've all read this story before for the most part. This is something that I want to point out before we get any further. You need to read your Bible. And you need to read it more than once. Because I've read this story a ton of times, but we're going to approach this story from a completely different angle. It's the same content, but we're going to go a completely different direction because we're bothering to read it under different presumptions. That's important. That's important. Because if I just went in here reading this word as it was, I might just miss something. I think it's interesting what happens here. Let's move down to verse 20 in that same chapter, Genesis 18, verse 20 through 22. It says, so the Lord said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so blatant that I must go down and see if they are as wicked as the outcry suggests. If not, I want to know. The two men turned and headed towards Sodom, but Abraham was still standing before the Lord. So we see here that God wants to walk among the Sodomites. It's a really interesting fact that that word became what that word became. But at the time, these were just people in a city, okay? So God wanted to walk among the Sodomites himself before he destroys the city. But I want you to notice this. At the end, it says the Lord stood with Abraham and the other two men headed towards Sodom, right? So the other two are walking. The Lord is hanging out with Abraham outside the tent where they had a meal together. Jump to Genesis 19, verse 1 through 3. Two angels came to Sodom in the evening while Lot was sitting at the city's gateway. Interesting. See, we don't, we don't totally realize that sometimes when we read the word, there's overlap in the stories. We think of everything as like, oh, we're just going through a story. No, there's, there's overlap that's taking place. Because while uh, Abraham is having fellowship with Jehovah. These two men, these two angels have gone to Sodom and they arrived there in the evening while Lot was sitting at the city's gateway. It says, when Lot saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face toward the ground. He said, here, my lords. Now he didn't use the, we, we have capital L and lowercase L to delineate the two different lords uh, in our translation, but he used a different Lord here. He said, here, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house. Stay the night and wash your feet. Then you can be on your way early in the morning. No, they replied, we'll spend the night in the town square. But he urged them persistently, so they turned aside with him and entered his house and prepared a feast for them, including bread baked without yeast, and they ate. Now, what time did the men arrive at Sodom? Evening. They arrived in the evening. Now, this is important because I want you to understand something. We are not figuratively talking about God and these angels walking the earth. They literally walked to Sodom. As you can see later, 
you could actually see Sodom from Abraham's tent. We're going to show that in just a little bit, but I want you to notice, like, they are actually walking on earth. Like, time has passed with them walking. The second thing that I want you to notice is back to that thing that I said before. He calls them in lords, but in this case, he doesn't say Jehovah. He says Adonai, but this is the same word that is used for Abraham that Sarah uses to show respect to him. She calls Abraham my Lord. So the Bible is being very specific. It's saying three individuals were on planet earth. One was Jehovah. Two were other authorities, angelic type beings. Jehovah hung out with Abraham outside the tent while the other two beings walked to Sodom. They literally walked from daytime to evening to get there. And they showed up in the exact number that they were sent out, meaning that they were literally there, literally walking. So they show up in Sodom. Remember, the Lord hung back. Jehovah hung back. But they are being so specific with the language here in this passage that they are helping you to see a picture that many of us, having read this passage before, have never noticed. Man, I told you, I was lied to as a kid in church. I was told it was three angels. It wasn't. I always just thought they teleported. They didn't. They wandered their butts down to Sodom. Now let's move on. Genesis 19, verse 23 through 28. The sun had just risen over the land as Lot reached Zoar. Then the Lord rained down sulfur and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. It repeats this. It was sent down from the sky by the Lord. Now we're back to using capital L, Jehovah. It was sent down from the sky by the Lord. So he overthrew those cities and all that region, including all the inhabitants of the cities and the vegetation that grew up from the ground. But Lot's wife looked back longingly and was turned into a pillar of salt. Abraham got up early in the morning and he went to the place where he had stood before the Lord and he looked out towards Sodom and Gomorrah and all the land in that region. And as he did so, he saw the smoke rising up from the land like smoke from a furnace, you can return to your seats. So at this destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, we again see the word Jehovah used, meaning that God was in person on earth with his angels, as well as in the heavens, raining down fire. You need to understand, Jehovah is the being. Jehovah is not the person. Jehovah is God. This is how you can have one of God hanging out on earth with Moses, eating food, walking down to see Sodom for himself, while also having God in the heavens sending down fire. You need to notice that when it says the Lord rained down sulfur and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah, it was sent down from the sky by the Lord. The picture that's actually being painted by the language that's used there in Hebrew is saying that it was sent from the source of Jehovah in the sky. So he's on earth. He's in the sky. Both are Jehovah. And yet both are unique. So we see this in the Old Testament. Remember, I told you, if all scripture don't say it, none of it does. Well, let's take a look at the New Testament. We see this also with Jesus on earth during his ministry. You don't got to stand up for this one because I'm just going to outline some passages of scripture for you. You can look it up if you want to later. We have this context about the ministry of Jesus that helps us to get an idea of the time frame. You know, most of us are told that Jesus was 30 years old when he started his ministry, and he was in ministry for about three to three and a half years. Does anybody of you know the, know the biblical precedent, or were you just told that and you just assume it's true? 
I know, me too. I know, I know. All of you are like, uh, do, I, do I have to admit that I don't know it? You don't have to admit it. I know that you don't know it. I didn't know it. I just assumed it's true, but it's actually in the Bible. So in Luke chapter 3, 23, again, I'm not going to read it. it. It indicates that Jesus was about 30 when his ministry began. Then in John 2.13, John 6.4, and John 11.55, so 2.13, 6.4, and 11.55, we see that three Passovers passed during the ministry of Christ. So with that information, and based on biblical and historical accounts, we know that Jesus' ministry began in the fall of 29 AD and lasted until about May 14th, 33 AD, which would be around three and a half years and would mean that he lived about 33 to 33 and a half years. So the Bible bothers to be specific about this. Why is this important? Because it shows us that for 33, 33 and a half years, Jesus was hanging out here. And this isn't only biblical, it's historically recorded. There's more record of Jesus' life on earth than there is of most of the emperors of Rome. And yet we don't question the emperors of Rome. We just take it as fact. Why? Because when it's God, it gets weird. Why does it get weird? Because we make the mistake of believing that the physical is more real than the spiritual when it's the other way around. See, the spiritual realm is more real than the physical realm that we live in. The spiritual realm lasted before the physical realm did, and it'll last after the physical realm wanes. But we have evidence, clearly, that Jesus lived and how long he was here. So he's on earth the entire time. He's talking about the Father in heaven the entire time, proclaiming the kingdom. And then we see this, that Next, chronologically, is the Spirit falls after Jesus ascends. So the Father sends the Son by way of the Spirit. He's here for 33 and a half years-ish. He ascends, and then the Holy Spirit comes. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. It says, while they were watching, Jesus was lifted up, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Move on to the next chapter, Acts 2, 1 through 4. Now, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like a violent wind blowing came from heaven and filled the entire house where they were sitting. And tongues spreading out like a fire appeared to them and came to rest on each one of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now, let me ask, couldn't God have just changed forms here? Because like, in a sense, they're all separate still, right? It's not like that whole situation where we talk about superheroes and it's like, I'm just saying, I've never seen them both at the same time, right? So you could look at this and you go, oh, okay, well, you see them separately, but it could still be modalism. Well, not unless Jesus is a liar, because the Bible tells us that Jesus is busy doing something else now. Now that the Holy Spirit has come down, day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, we can look at John 14, 2 through 3. Jesus said this, predicting what was to come. He said, there are many dwelling places in my Father's house. Otherwise, I would have told you because I'm going away to make ready a place for you. And if I go and make ready a place for you, I will come again and take you to be with me so that where I am, you may be too. So Jesus left to go do what? To prepare a place for us. He didn't go so that he could get changed into a new costume. He went so that he could get busy about the next task. And then the Holy Spirit could get busy about his next task. All Jehovah, all God, all the same being, but distinct persons. See, Jesus isn't just God in one of his forms appearing so that another form can come. He is actually at work right now, just as the Holy Spirit is at work, and just as the Father is at work, doing different tasks. 
Okay, okay, Pastor Pepper. So if they can be in separate locations, have they ever been present on earth at the same time uniquely? AKA fullness of God at one time on earth. Has that happened? Yes. In Matthew chapter three, verse 16 through 17. Now, this one alone refutes the oneness theology, which is also called modalism. You heard me use that word. This is God in three modes. I wanna take a moment to take a break because many of you actually think of the Trinity as modes and you don't even realize that you do. There's a, uh, there's a common comparison that's made of people saying that the Trinity is like water. How water is one thing, but it can come in gas, liquid, and solid. That's modalism, not Trinitarianism. You believe in one thing in multiple modes. We believe in one being in three distinct persons. So no, it's, it's not like water in three different types. It's not like that. That's modalism. And this, this little segment of scripture right here confronts modalism. It confronts uh, oneness theology. Because if God simply exists in three modes at different times, then why do we see all three modes at the same time referring to each other and confirming each other here in Matthew chapter 3? It says, after Jesus was baptized, so who's on earth being baptized? Jesus. Just as he was coming up out of the water, the heavens opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. So, okay, what is descending? The Spirit of God. Now, you must understand, the Spirit of God was not a dove. All right? Like a dove. It's the best description they can give. It means he was coming down gracefully. All right? It doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit's a bird, y'all. Come on, man. So the Holy Spirit's coming. Okay, so Jesus is here. Right above his noggin, we have a not dove. We have a a graceful spirit, right? And a voice from heaven said, this is my dear son. Okay, he calls him son, and he says my, which means this is the father. You got it right. And in him I take great delight. So we have the son in the water. We have the Holy Spirit in the earth. And then we've got God speaking The Father from heaven, all of them Jehovah, all of them distinct persons. Okay, all right. So we've got them in different spaces, doing different things. We got different tasks. We got different jobs. We see them all in the same place. Okay, that's really cool. Um, Do we ever see them work together to accomplish works in the New Testament like we saw at creation? Because at creation, we see how they all work together, right? The Father was speaking stuff. Everything that was created was created by the Son, by Jesus, by the Word. And we see that the Holy Spirit was hovering over the earth as all of this was happening, bringing it all through to fruition. But do we ever see that in the New Testament? Because remember, we always want to move laterally across Scripture, We never just want to take somebody's word for it. Amen. When we're we're trying to construct truth and doctrine, guys, do not take anybody's word for it. Read it yourself. Receive it and find what aligns with that truth. We do see this in John chapter 14, verse 15 through 17. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Then I will ask the Father And he will give you another advocate. Now, advocate is not lowercase, it's uppercase, because this is a title to be with you forever. And that title is who? The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot accept because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he resides with you and will be in you. So Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Then I, Jesus, will ask the Father, and he will give you the Spirit. All of these are working together. How? Jesus is unlocking the kingdom, and the Father is sending the Spirit to help us see that kingdom come alive on earth. I'm going to repeat that again, because y'all need to know what's happening here. Jesus is unlocking the kingdom. Guys, 
it is unfortunate that we stop there so many times in our Christian faith. It is unfortunate that we stop at the unlocking of the kingdom. Guys, what good is an unlocked door if you don't step through it? What good is an unlocked door if there is nothing behind it? Come on, my gamers. But see, Jesus unlocks the kingdom that the Father might send the Spirit so that we can see that kingdom come alive on earth. Through what? Through us. They are all working together to accomplish the will of Jehovah. All three persons working for the one being that is God. I'm going to go ahead and have the band come up. You can return to your seats. So I want to break all of this down tonight. We went from, hey, this is where we stand to these are the people who disagree with us and what they believe, to let's dig in with some real honest questions about this whole Trinity thing and see what the Bible says. Guys, that is how you find doctrinal truth. The Bible, the Bible is the only book ever written that's not afraid of your questions. I'm gonna repeat that again because some of y'all need to understand something. The Bible is the only book that is not afraid of your questions. Too often, Christians shy away from the questions of the world around them, and it's nonsense because the Bible that they allegedly stand on is not afraid of questions. If you ask questions of the Quran, you're going to find some weird stuff. It's actually a really easy book to tear apart. It don't even agree with itself, y'all. Did you know half of Muslims don't even believe that their Bible is actually like God ordained? They don't even, like half of them don't even believe that the Quran is God ordained. They believe that a dude just wrote it. Well, who cares? There's a lot of books that dudes wrote that I'm never gonna read in my life. Because they don't offer anything of substance to me. Why would you devote your whole life to something that isn't even inspired by a higher being. It just doesn't even make sense. It's an easy one to pick apart. You have other cults outside of Christianity that have used Christianity to kind of create a spinoff. And if you look at their extra scriptures, it's easy to pick apart. The Bible's problematic. And, and the devil's greatest way of keeping you tied down and keeping you limited and keeping you away from the call to reach people with the gospel is keeping you from opening it. Oh no, it's just hard for me to read it. Yeah, you think, man? Every time you open your Bible, you're going to war. Every time you open the word and you ask questions, you're picking a fight. Man, if, if all it takes to shut you up and remove your anointing from you is to keep you from reading a book, what do you think I'm gonna do? I'm gonna keep you from wanting to read the book. In fact, I might even keep it from you by making it convenient. I might even use the fact that it's on your phone to drop a little notification in here that uh, your favorite channel just released a new video. You want to watch it? You want to do it? You want to do it? You can always read this later. You want to do it? You share it? You want to do it? Eh, it's Christian. Do it. It'll help you. It'll make you better. Church commentary. Woo! Do it. Your friend just texts you. Aren't, aren't you trying to reach them for Jesus? Just, just put a pause on the word for a second. Just, just hit that notification. You never know. It might change their life forever or... <laughs> It might just rob you of your anointing. While you're busy selecting which translation you want to read, you accidentally swipe. And I don't know if, about you, but somehow Apple News just shows up like as the main thing on my phone all the time. 
it's so dumb. I don't even know what's happening. I'm just like going through like apps and like getting rid of stuff and then pff, Apple News. And I'm like, oh, look, another stupid thing happening in the world. You see this stuff? You know what I'm talking about? Distraction. Guys, the, the, the word isn't afraid of your questions, but you got to bother. We talked about this last week. You got you to gotta open this thing. You got to read it. We saw tonight how the, the Trinity is demonstrated at the beginning of the Bible as being three persons at creation. And it's also demonstrated at the beginning of the Gospels at the baptism of Jesus. We see them operating distinctly in both the Old and the New Testament. We see them all take on the same title, even though each of them are distinct. We see them work together to accomplish different responsibilities of the same task. All of these contribute to a word that oh, the Bible doesn't use, Trinity. It's a Trinity. One being Three persons. How many beings? How many persons? You hear me, YouTube watcher? Yeah, one being, three persons. We ask the questions. Guys, the questions that I just asked are all the toughest questions you'll get when it comes to someone who doesn't agree with this doctrine. Those are the toughest questions you're gonna get. And I just showed you, it's, it's right here. And if you, if you took notes, which... You should have, you should have. Then you, you can have this discussion. But y'all don't, don't let me be the one who reads the Bible for you. Too many people were burned at the stake, hung and beheaded so that you could have this word in your hands and your language. Heroes of the faith who put their life on the line so that you could read this thing. Don't you dare pass that up. And we talked last week about how we need to know the difference between crucial doctrine and non-crucial. This is crucial doctrine. Why in the world is this crucial doctrine, Pastor Pepper? I'll tell you. Because if God is three persons, not three separate gods, then ignoring, belittling, or only serving God one at a time is only serving 33.3% .3 of God. And if you do not serve God in his fullness, you are not serving God. Listen to me, there's some denominations who worship the Father specifically. They grant him all authority. They grant him all honor and yet they miss it. There is no difference between those Christian denominations and the Jews who do the exact same thing, Father only. There are some who worship just the Holy Spirit, my charismatics, come on. The ones who like to sweat in church. They spend all their time chasing tongues Chasing the gifts. Come on, I'm going to prophesy right now. Dude, what are you doing? You forgot there's some other pieces of the puzzle, didn't you, homie? You can't just worship the Holy Spirit. And there's some, and I would say this is the most common in the church today, who only worship Jesus. There's been multiple times where I have been um, asked to join in a cross-denominational um, conference with our youth group. And I always ask the same question because I know what answer I'm gonna get. I say, this is sick. I, I, I'm all about the unity of the church. That's really sweet. So what are we gonna do if like the spirit wants to move? So far, I've always gotten the same answer. Well, man, you know, we're just... We're just going to keep it all about Jesus. Yeah, man, if we just focus on Jesus, if we just focus on Christ, that's all that matters. Dude, Jesus didn't even focus on Jesus. 
He said, the things that I do, I do not do on my own, but it is the Father who gives me authority to do such things. He said, the words that I speak, I do not say on my own. It is the Father that gives me these words. He deferred to the, he said, listen, it's better that I go and prepare a place for you so that my Father might send the advocate. You have to know this about the persons of the Godhead. They all point to one another. The Father uplifts the Son and sends the Spirit to do work. The Spirit convicts us of the things of Christ and draws us to the presence of the Father. And the Son made the way for us to reach the Father and open the door for the Spirit to be poured out. They all work in tandem. You don't get to pick and choose which one you're most comfortable with and roll with that. This is crucial doctrine because if we are to worship God, we must worship him in his fullness. No, I'm sorry, but the buck doesn't stop with Jesus and Jesus would say the same thing. Our new life in salvation started with him, but it doesn't stop there. It continues on to a life empowered by the spirit under the authority of the father in the same way that he lived. You do understand, right, that Jesus didn't just come to be your sacrifice. He came to be your example. There are many who would say that this doctrine is negotiable. And to them, I would say, how can you get a 33 on a test and call it a pass? An F is still an F, man. Either you take God for who he is or you turn him down because you want what you want. All over this room, I want every head bowed for just a moment. You tuning in online, same thing. I want you to be real with yourself. Are you cool with God on his terms? Are you cool with God on his terms? Are you looking to submit him to yours? I know it's crazy. We're only one being one person. But we aren't God. Can you accept him for who he truly is?